Hi, I am Kathy Curry. I am a technology manager with State Farm just up the road about a half a mile. I lead a couple of product teams that uh, recruits interns for or software engineers coming in as interns. I also lead a product for our STEM community engagement. So a lot of uh, very close partnerships with Tech Titans through our relationship with State Farm. Super excited to be here today. I get to introduce David Matthews of RevTech. Um, I do have some questions prepared, but truly this is just an opportunity for me to ask the questions that may pose you know, thoughts for you, but feel free to chime in and be part of the conversation at any point. So officially, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today David Matthews from RevTech. David is an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist with 30 years of experience in building companies from startup to fruition. As the founder of RevTech, a venture capital firm in North Texas that invests in the technologies and concepts driving the future of retail, David has shaped countless young entrepreneurs through RevTech's mentorship program by bringing the city's top talent together and pairing them with portfolio companies that are changing the future of retail. David is also extremely passionate and champions women in the industry, and he launched RevTech's Equity for Women Fund, which is the first ever seed funding investing in female entrepreneurs. So, as I said, we've got the next few minutes, 50, give or take, that I've got the questions, but as I said, please feel free to chime in, interrupt, and ask questions along the way. Ready for the first one? I am ready. All right. So David, you got your start in retail. How did that early experience shape your philosophy of helping other entrepreneurs? Well, starting in, have any of y'all worked in retail before? A couple of you. Yeah. Um, to me, I wouldn't trade it for anything. In my high school and college years, I worked in restaurant and retail. And the big thing I got out of that bar none was really the focus on the customer and, and the importance of understanding that you're in business to serve a customer and that you got to do a good job. So that really goes with anything I'm doing or investing in is serving a customer. And my very first job out of college, uh, which I laugh at, you know, but it was so fun, was I was hired by a manufacturer's rep firm who had a number of consumer electronics lines. And my job was to go into stores and train salespeople on how to sell our products hmm. better. And um, there was such turnover in those jobs that every month when I would come in, there'd be a couple new people to train. And, uh, and it was a lot of fun uh, to, uh, to give like buzzwords on different consumer electronics products. And back in that day, it was all about surround sound and oh, digital yeah. versus analog yes. signal, yes. all those things. Mm -hmm. Probably had a lot of folks that, I guess, young brains coming in with all kinds of ideas. So when you think about that turnover in people each time you went in, what were the challenges and just trying to help them embrace, here's the product, you know, I, I, this is their job to sell the product, but how, how do you handle that turnover so frequently? <laughs> It's, it's just the nature of the beast in restaurant and retail, and, and nothing's changed in, a, in the 30 years since I was doing that job. Um, but it's been one of my themes for retail tech investing mm -hmm. has been things to equip store associates or restaurant mm -hmm. associates with tools so that they can better serve the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example of that's a local company, Theatro, that's developed a communication device where the store associate, like in a container store, has like bionic superhuman powers because they can tap the computer for product lookups. They can tap other associates in the store for shared knowledge. So, and, and they can use it for training on product training in between customers. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating stuff with technology. So David, how has RevTech's culture changed in the past five years? Well, she prompted me with this question, so I had overnight to sleep on it and think about it. But I would say the profound change that I've seen, and I think it may be in part uh, thanks to STEM training, but when I got in venture capital, and well, I'll start. When I was a young entrepreneur doing what this gentleman in the back is doing, p producing meetings and events with audiovisual support all over the country, um, 
back when I was building that company, we had 150 employees and I think 140 were men. Um, and then I got into venture capital and the first two firms I worked with were all men and we invested, guess what, only in men. Um, with RevTech, it's been, I'm the sole manager of the shop and I've really used my team. I've cultivated young people and helped them learn the venture business. And by definition, I've had gender and ethnic diversity. And guess what? Our investment portfolio is very diverse. And before, like six, seven years ago, I could not say that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's certainly something I'm the happiest about, is to see that develop. I know I uh, stole a little thunder with the fund that you created. Was that prompted because you saw a lack of diversity? Well, it was prompted by opportunity. That fund uh, Kathy's referring to is our Equity for Women fund that we launched um, a year and a half ago. And the opportunity was we had an investment in Houston that we wanted to go bigger in than our fund could support. So I wanted another pool of capital so we could amplify our investment in that company and, and be a substantial early investor. Very exciting company. They, have, um, a, they use blockchain uh, to uh, provide transparency for the supply chain. For, uh, for coffee, for diamonds, for all different sorts of things. Um, and uh, so that was one on the deal side. Then on the team side, I had a young woman working for me. It, she was two years out of college, her first job in venture. And I wanted to accelerate her learning curve. So creating this Equity for Women Fund gave me an opportunity to put her on the investment committee to not just champion deals, but to have a vote, a decision in the deals we did. Oh, that's fantastic. You had me at diamonds. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> All right. Um, so David, this one's a long one, so bear with me. Uh, to date, RevTech Ventures has funded over 50 companies, has had five successful exits, and has- Seven now. Uh-oh, seven successful exits, and has driven over $250 million of early stage capital formation uh, over half a billion now, but stats yeah. get out of date Man. real quick. That's just since last night. <laughs> the firm has created an impressive mentor network with over 100 entrepreneurs, investors, and retail industry executives. How are we doing on 100? Are we close to that? or? Yeah, we're holding steady there. Okay. All right. So given all of this came in under your leadership, how do you want to be remembered? Well, yeah, I, I want to be remembered as the, you know, venture cap, in, in the world you have angel investors and venture capital investors, and do you all know where the term angel came from? <laughs> it really came from uh, differentiating from the venture capital investors who are demons, I guess. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I want to be remembered as the most angelic of the demonic venture capital <laughs> investors. <laughs> As, uh, yeah, the, the difference, angels bet with their own wallet, and, uh, uh, but venture capitalists raise money from other people, and if they do a bad job, they're fired. So venture capitalists tend to be a little more severe in how they work with startups and how quickly they would pull the trigger on firing a founder. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like the last thing in the world I do because I'm doing the investment because of the founder usually. So what informs your investment thesis? And what would you tell a new CEO the key ingredients are for fostering culture and innovation at a company? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> We've got plenty of time. Really. We're only five minutes into this and we're, you know. Oh, we're, yeah, we're we've blasted. Halfway through. Nice, nice. Right? Well, let me, let me think about it because there's at least two parts to that question. Uh, the first part I heard what informs my, my investment thesis at RevTech, and, and it's really all about the entrepreneur and the value proposition they're bringing to the market. So with the entrepreneur, what I liked, I was talking about the Beatles before we started and watching that get back sessions on, on Disney Plus uh, over the holiday. is really cool. It reminded me that people thought the Beatles were an overnight success when they like stormed America in the early 60s. But they'd actually been together for five years. And like in Hamburg, they were there for a year or two playing like 
12 hours a day, seven days a week together. So they actually got really tight as a band working together during that time. And then when they came out and had their kind of launch to the world, they were this overnight success, even though it took five years of, of like long, long hours uh, working together. So that's how I like to think about the entrepreneur. I, I want to see, ideally, a team uh, that has worked together toward, toward really getting expertise around something, something that solves a major problem in the world. And, and so I like to see evidence of domain expertise mm -hmm. with the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And then second, coupled with it, is the value proposition that they're bringing to market. You know, is it something that's really disruptive? And by disruptive, I mean, in an ideal frame, it would be 10 times better than the next best alternative and 10 times cheaper. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like a 100x um, mm -hmm. bar. Uh, not many things get that high, but you think about the things that have made the most profound difference in your experience. We, we take our mobile devices for granted mm -hmm. now, but boy, when those things first came out, what, it's been 15 years now, can you believe it? Mm -hmm. Um, it was a game changer, right? Yep. You suddenly had like your record player, your camera, your <laughs> computer, all in one device. everything all in one device mm -hmm. in your hand. Mm -hmm. So that kind of disruption is what we're looking for. So that's kind of on what informs the investment thesis. And then two things coupled with that around investment thesis. Um, you know, one is well, obviously, it needs to be a big enough market opportunity that something could scale and get somewhere. So that's why you always see investors want to see like at least a billion dollar addressable market to invest in. <coughs> but um, what, what I like to see is, can this company scale efficiently with capital? Um, because we're a very small fund in middle America. So if something is going to take several hundred million of capital to scale, we're, we're probably not a very good candidate because we could not provide all that capital. Um, so I like, ideally, I like things that don't require too much capital to grow and scale. <coughs> and then lastly, and this is a big one, do I think we have value to help this company more than just writing a check? Uh, a lot of times we'll say, you know what, we don't have any expertise around this, either directly on my team or in our 100-person mentor network. Uh, we, I just don't see how we could do any more than write a check. So we have to really be able to see that we could make a fundamental difference um, with, within our network of, of knowledge uh, to help move the needle. So that's that part of the question, but you had another part. I think it was about culture? Yeah, it, um, fostering culture and innovation. I know when we talked yesterday, David said, well, I don't know that I'm overly innovative. And I thought, hmm, I think you are. Sometimes we don't realize that, <laughs> but. Well, I, th um, I think the biggest thing to me the last few years has been really driving alignment of, um, of understanding. And, and you'd think it'd be simple with small teams. I mean, my team's small. I have five you know, direct reports at RevTech, so a very small team. Um, and the companies we're investing in, when they're starting, they typically have, you know, two, three, four, five people total. Um, but you wouldn't believe how many people got, kind of get focused in their lane. And uh, I think it's just so important to have um, uh, what's called objectives with key results. Has anybody heard that term, OKRs? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, a very famous venture capitalist in another league than me on the West Coast named John Doerr, uh, who was behind things like Google, uh, wrote a book about objectives and key results. And we've really adopted it at RevTech, and I really push it out to all our portfolio. The beauty of it is everybody creates a set of OKRs and reviews them regularly from the CEO down to, you know, the person making coffee. And, uh, and if you have those known through the company, everybody has the opportunity to be in really good alignment because they know what each other's objectives are and, and the metrics that will be achieved to signal achievement of those objectives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've just found it to be a game changer for, for my small team and for companies that we work with. So talking about OKRs, um, a, an important part of that process is Looking back, how did we do? Where could we make improvements? 
does your team also go through that type of ex exercise? In our world, we call it a retrospective. Uh, we could do better at that, Kathy. We, de we definitely do annually at the end of the year. How did we hit our objectives for the year? But not as well during the course of the year. What I think we do better is adjusting course during mm -hmm. the course of the year because reality on the ground changes yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you have these OKRs that are baked in for 12 months and rigid, uh, it can be really tough. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think we've gotten better about sitting down on a, at least a monthly, at least a quarterly, but generally monthly basis to kind of review OKRs and do we need course adjustment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a pretty regular cadence. We do ours based on semester because of the work we do, you know, was around students and being in the community and having interns. So we do ours on a regular basis too. But that is that I love when I hear those words, OKRs. <laughs> well, right. I mean, the things that drive dissatisfaction of employees and jobs, more often than not, is not that the job sucks. It's that the visibility what on what's going on and what's my goal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very true. So, um, David, how do you feel the startup community in uh, DFW is doing at present? You know, I, yeah, I got a chance to sleep on that one, Kathy, because I didn't have an answer when we <laughs> talked yesterday. She gave me a lovely prep call yesterday so that I wouldn't be like a deer in headlights uh. with anything. Um, but I think the startup community in Dallas is as ever-changing as startups themselves are. If I look at like frames of time, we went through like 2013 through 2016 were like the deck years when the Dallas Entrepreneur Center got going. And it was all about things around the deck that were happening. In fact, my office for RevTech is the old deck uh, location in the West End downtown. Um, then Capital Factory came to town and then all of a sudden everything was about Capital Factory and all their activities. And then during the pandemic, Capital Factory went virtual and got real quiet, and, and then it just kind of dispersed into a thousand different things. But I see, so it's just always changing, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I, mean, any, I mean, any snapshot of time you want to take, the way the startup community is organized is always evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. There's new things that I can't even tell you the monikers of, like Trey Bowles that started the deck is doing some new thing called Inno City. I don't okay. even fully know what that is yet. Um, you have the Dallas Innovation Alliance, um, uh, you know, Tech Titans. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've got to mention that. Uh, so it's just ever changing. Um, but, you know, what I reflect at, though, when I started my first company doing what he's doing in the back 30 years ago, hi, um, there was nothing in 1991. I, I went to like the small business administration <laughs> looking at forms for like what oh. do you do <laughs> there there was nothing there was no deck no, there was no, no nothing mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, somehow we winged it and figured it out but um but today we're blessed with all these there's resources for everything mm -hmm. google all right any questions from y'all here before i move into the last couple <laughs> yeah, come on. Yes, please. Um, there, I'm Julie Johnson with Thumbtap, and uh, one question I have is, what is one of your favorite ventures that you invested in, and how did you see, how, how were they successful, and why did you enjoy investing in them? Can you repeat the question? Sure, I'll Just repeat the question. We're and I know your smiling face. I can, I, you're actually one you can tell you're smiling, even though you've got a mask on. <laughs> but I'm, I know you from HumCap. And, um, and, you know, I guess most venture investors would list their favorite investments by, by the size of the return <laughs> at the end of the day. But to me, that's not, to me, that's not the thing that drives me with venture investing. It's important to have exits, believe me, because without exits, you can't keep doing new entrances mm -hmm. over time. So for sustainability sa sake, um, exits are very important. But the things I get the most fulfillment out of, Julie, right, are <laughs> when, and you'll hear it in my comments tonight on the stage, when I can be that matchmaker 
that can put that entrepreneur together with a mentor that can really change the outlook of the game. And when I see that chemistry take hold, that's like the ultimate. Um, and my best successes, not coincidentally, have been the ones where I've been the most fortunate in getting that mentor-mentee recipe correct. So an example of that would be, uh, I'll just pick one of them, because um, they're all fun to tell about. But one, there was this guy who was the COO and CFO. He had both roles at Pier 1 Imports in Fort Worth. His name was Kerry Turner. And, um, and I had a guy who was helping us with real estate stuff or something offered to introduce me to him. He knew him. And he made a couple intros, and I reached out and tried to follow up a few times. Kerry never returned an email, a call, or anything mm -hmm. for after a year of outreach. So I thought, well, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work. But then I read in the newspaper, Kerry Turner has retired from Pier 1 Imports. He left abruptly. And you know what, Julie? The very next day, he showed up at RevTech. <laughs> He said, you know, I, I got your outreach, and I, I just was too covered up to really respond. I wanted to because I very much would love to be a mentor, and I'd love to learn how to mentor. And, and it was a eureka because at that very moment in time, I had done a new investment in a technology called Door Technology that, that did analytics to track traffic through the door of a store to transaction. Um, to track that conversion rate of traffic to transaction. And Kerry said, oh, I'd love to get in on this one because, um, because traffic analytics was the best thing I did in my 20 years at Pier 1, the thing that made the biggest difference. So he became a mentor to that technology company. Then at the same time, I had a new investment in a home decor startup called The Citizenry downtown. And I'm like, Kerry, I, this is like next generation Pier 1 Imports. These two women are, uh, are finding artist communities and designing you know, great consumer home decor products from around the world. But they really need some guidance as much on what not to do as what to do. And he became an early mentor, board member, and investor in the company and, and really changed the game there. So I got a twofer out of Kerry Turner after a year of no return calls. A twofer. So I'm curious, you mentioned Pier 1. What happened to them? When he left, did everything go in the tanker or what? <laughs> they, were going to, they were going dramatically the wrong direction when he left, which is probably why he left. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he was, he was kind of like the guy holding the whole thing, to get the pieces together. Mm -hmm. And when he left, they were out of business pretty quick because he left in uh, 2016 and they were out of business in 2021. Mm -hmm. They're gone. Yeah. Very sad. Okay, um, so what do you tell young entrepreneurs today about getting started? Just go, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I've always done it. <laughs> well, definitely solve the equation of, of having something that's going to solve a problem for a customer. Because <laughs> okay. business is all about serving a customer. I fibbed. That was the last one. <laughs> I'm off Sa easy. Save the best one for last, right? I'm off easy here. Oh. Does anybody have a zinger? Right. Well, you just said that you know about serving the customer, and I think in retail, the technology replacing uh, people mm -hmm. is very evident. So, do you have any comments on what that's going to do to the customer experience? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. That's a thinker. Um, you think about the onslaught of Amazon over the last 25 years, um, and they've really hit, I mean, the growth is totally driven by having more selection at lower prices delivered faster. So they've, and they've taken each of those about as far as they can be taken. Um, uh, which, I mean, there's been no growth engine in retail like Amazon, period. But um, not a lot of that, I mean, it is about giving the consumer a great experience. When you get more selection at a lower cost delivered faster, I mean, th those are three pretty big check marks. Um, but Amazon is now, 
in the business of figuring out how to be a retailer. Mm. You know, they're opening up a store down the street at the Galleria. I read Maria Halkias in the morning news was speculating whether it would be a bookstore or they have, um, they have like a four stars concept. They may have one of those at, um, at uh, Legacy West. Um, but four stars is like the things on their website that get four stars or above rating. But then they have a third concept that's more of a convenience store that's Amazon Go. So Maria was speculating about which of those concepts it would be. But I bring that up because Amazon, and of course they bought a little chain called Whole Foods mm. as well. But Amazon for the last five years or so has been dramatically trying to figure out how to really be in the customer service business uh, around consumer experience. And, uh, and they're not necessarily a whole lot better <laughs> than anyone else. Uh, companies that have found a way to survive or thrive in the Amazon age have been ones like I mentioned earlier, Container Store with Theatro. Uh, Container Store is really big on, on uh, getting top quality store associates, really training them more than, you know, more than store associates get trained at any other chain and, and really um, empowering them. So, uh, and you know, as a result, they've been able to hold their own in the age of Amazon, even though what they're selling in those stores, <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure all those things you could find an equivalent on Amazon. So I don't know, does that come around to answering your question? I think there's neat opportunities that are ways that provide that more of that red carpet customer service. And I think if, if I interpreted it right, it's more of the replacement of people by automation. Did I catch that? Yeah, like is that good or bad? I can't be mm -hmm. I, I really wonder how this current moment of, um, of delivery everything is going to play out. Um, I mean, I, um, my wife and I are not so much at this, but our son is currently living with us and, and he's 26 and, and um, everything comes delivery. <laughs> he gets 10 deliveries a day of, of everything, anything and everything. Um, so I, th that to me is a puzzler. So much of the workforce has shifted over to people that are driving um, things and, and people prefer driving things over people. <laughs> So, uh, so the, the delivery of things has really, I mean, it's just massive now. When we drive down the road, I mean, how many of the cars we're driving alongside are people out delivering something? Uh, I wonder how that shakes out, because um, that, that does, I mean, it just takes humanity out of the equation, because you don't even generally see the delivery person unless they're waving as they walk back to their car. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we'll look and see this was just a temporal distortion in the early 2020s during a pandemic, um, but I kind of hope so. I mean, it's, it, it really depersonalizes the whole shopping, dining experience. What other questions? What other questions? Sorry. I can tell you about a couple other favorite investments. That would be awesome. Uh, talking about this Amazon Go or um, feature or this last mile delivery that's such a big wave now. So um, I'll talk about another investment for a minute. Um, this is a startup out of San Diego that we actually met the very best way. There's a number of ways we meet new investment opportunities. I mean, a lot just come in across the door and knock on the door and say, invest in my company. There's a lot that get referred by uh, mentors, by investors, by what have you. There's a lot that we meet at different like pitch competitions and uh, things where you go to hear startups present and look for investors. Um, uh, and we look at, my, my small team, we look at uh, at least 500, but last year it was closer to 1,000 investment opportunities in a year. So we see a lot of stuff. Um, but my favorite way, I want to see if anybody can guess it. What, what do you think my f favorite source of a new investment opportunity is? Anybody hazard a guess? It's a, not a trick question. <laughs> Ask my son. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably good. Yeah, uh, 
My, my favorite way is from the CEO of a startup company that we've invested in, telling another entrepreneur, you really got to go talk to Dave at RevTech because they've been great to work with. Um, that's my favorite way because it's like pre-vetted both yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, so we had a company like that out of San Diego that found us by the uh, store analytics company, Door, introduced us. <coughs> and uh, these guys, <laughs> um, we liked them because they're a real smart team. So, th so uh, we were interested in investing. But what they were doing, we weren't that jazzed about what they were doing. They were building robots that were going to roll around stores and augment the human staff in the store. Like, you know, can I show you a different pair of shoes? And I, I like, we like you guys. You have a lot of brain power in this thing. Um, and, uh, and it's very interesting around the things you can discover through the eyes of a robot. But, you know, so what we did, we did invest. We said we like you guys and we're confident you're going to, like, pivot this thing to something that really makes sense because roll around robots in a store doesn't make sense at all to us. So we paired them with the... Um, with the former chief technology officer from GameStop, Jeff Donaldson. He became their lead mentor. <clears throat> and what he did for him was he put together a panel of retail CTOs locally. And, and he had them present to these guys to really fine tune the use case uh, for what they could do in the store. And what they wound up coming up with was abandoning the roll around robot concept and getting to the essence of what their value really was, which was machine vision. They were very good early movers around, around having the ability to take the input to a camera and really determine what's happening here in terms of movement, in terms of action, in terms of intent. So they developed a, a, a consumer tracking engine and, um, and really went down the path of automated store technology. Um, they got, um, we introduced them to uh, the venture arm of MasterCard at, at the NRF trade show. And uh, MasterCard Ventures became an early strategic investor in them. And they started getting pilot stores teed up. Everybody wanted, I mean, State Farm probably even wanted to do one. <laughs> but everybody was lining up out the door to have these guys and their competitors. And they have several competitors that are well funded. Um, but a lot of pilot store opportunities. These guys did them for Rite Aid Drug, Duncan Brands. I mean, I could go on and on about 10 different brands, mostly around food, convenience, drug, those categories. Um, and they would do these pilot stores. Uh, they did one on a military base. They did one on a university campus. Uh, they did one in the Glendale Shopping Mall in LA um, for Rite Aid. And uh, the problem with these stores is all these companies just wanted to put their toe in the water to say, yes, we have an answer to Amazon Go. Um, but mm -hmm. clearly none of them felt the pressure, like, we better do something here. Because they all just did their pilot store and then just kind of sat there. Like, they checked the box and mm -hmm. everything's good. Mm -hmm. Like, well, we can't really build a business off this. So these guys, like, what are we going to do? They'd raised $40 million from SoftBank. So... But they were plowing through it pretty quick with 80, you know, high-end engineers on the team. Mm -hmm. um, so they were burning through that money really quick. And, and during COVID, they just had this epiphany of, like, we got to own our destiny. We're going to open our own store. And so they did a Valet Fresh in downtown San Diego, where they are, and did their own convenience store model. And all of a sudden, they have people from all over the world flying in, like, how are these guys doing this? Because you can tag in the store with their app, grab whatever you want off the shelf. You can pick things up, put them in a different place. You can put things back. You, I mean, you can try to mess with the system all you want, but it's, it's pinpoint accurate um, on the transactions. So what's wound up happening with them is, um, is they're now, all these last mile delivery companies have all these things called micro-fulfillment centers or dark stores. Mm -hmm. These are stores like warehouses, basically, that are conveniently located to be close to the customers, uh, where drivers can go in and grab stuff and fill the order and race off to go deliver it. Um, but none of these companies, GoPuff, Delivery Hero, Gorillas, DoorDash even, 
None of these companies are making money. They're raising billions and billions and billions of dollars, but they're not making money because they don't have systems in place. I mean, they're just flooding inventory into their stores. They throw as much as 10% in the dumpster mm. because they don't know what's coming or going. Um, but what these guys bring to the equation to those last mile delivery companies is they can make those dark store warehouses shoppable by end consumers and they can provide pinpoint accurate inventory tracking for what's coming in and going out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it really looks like it can be the game changer for this whole last mile delivery thing to actually work. Because how it's currently configured is, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars have poured into it, but it's utter chaos, <laughs> total chaos. So that one's exciting because it all dials back to that an original match we made with the CTO from GameStop mm -hmm. that got these guys from a dead end track to the right path. That was a real long answer and it wasn't even a question. <laughs> Do you have certain uh, pitch competitions or other networks that you found that are great sources of this resource at all? Yeah, we do. There's, there's Julie, there's actually a few um, uh, firms like us around the country that have a similar focus. There's one in New York called uh, XRC Labs that's partnered with Parsons School of Design. And we, we refer to these guys as coopetition, but they have a similar focus around new brands and, and new technologies for retail, so we've, we've um, invested in two or three things we met through their network. And then there's one on the west coast called Plug and Play, and they ha they're big and they have lots of verticals, but the first one they launched years and years ago was retail, and they still do it, so that, that's been a pretty good source of deal flow. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a few like that. Um, but a new turn for us is we've never really gotten corporate partnership down and um, and we've been in a nice back and forth for about six months now we, we actually have a neighbor in the West End um, uh, that's the innovation um, lab space for Sam's Club oh. and uh, for whatever reason we never even thought to knock on their door <laughs> even though they're two blocks away uh, but over the last six months we've developed a good dialogue with them because they're desperately seeking innovation for their store model uh, to be more competitive with Costco and things like that. And, uh, and, you know, so we have a very symbiotic need of finding new innovations that are going to be scalable and change the game. So um, we're increasingly working together on, on that discovery process of, of new deals. So for us, it would be a little bit of money, and for them, it would be we'll give you a test in our stores. So th those, are, those are avenues of, I call it, ponds to fish in, finding more ponds to fish in where you know you're going to get a good catch. <laughs>